to the knowledge of the university. But the University of Washington sits on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people, uh, most of whom are now members of the Muckleshoot Nation. It's my great pleasure to introduce today uh, Dr. Ravi Kaparapu from the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Ravi is joining us remotely, as you uh, probably can tell. Uh, so uh, I wanted but to introduce him to you. He uh, began his career uh, at the University of Pune in India, where he received a master's degree in astrophysics. Uh, from there, he continued the trend of staying in hot climates and moved to uh, Baton Rouge and got a PhD at uh, the Louisiana State University. Uh, from there, he moved on to a postdoc at uh, Penn State University. Uh, it was at about this time that I met Ravi when I received an email out of the blue that he was somebody who was tired of working on gravitational waves and wanted to work on exoplanets and asked if I might suggest a project to him. So you might have thought that he was working on exoplanets to this point in his career, but he was not. He was working on gravitational waves. Um, um, I was very delighted to have the chance to work with him then and get him started on exoplanet research, uh, working on uh, dynamical stability of habitable zones uh, being perturbed by uh, a planet of arbitrary mass and eccentricity, which I still think is a great paper. And if any of you are interested in that topic, I suggest checking out Robbie's uh, first exoplanet paper. Um, well, he was at Penn State. After, um, at that point, he uh, then transitioned to working with Jim Casting and getting into uh, more serious exoplanet research. Uh, a few year, a few years after that, then in probably around 2015 or so, I'm guessing he moved to a Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, where he is still there now as a planetary scientist, and civil servant. Uh, he is now also the uh, science PI of this Chance Group, um, an ICAR team that is uh, very interested in uh, the habitability and atmospheres of M dwarf planets. Uh, before I do turn it over to Ravi for the uh, the seminar today, um, I'm going to ask that all of you. Uh, turn off your video and your audio. Um, looks like most of you have already done that, but just to make sure there's no uh, spurious noise and uh, that Ravi has all the bandwidth he needs. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, I'm going to ask you also to, withhold, to hold that until the uh, end of the seminar. Um, you can feel free to type it into the chat um, if you want to just have it uh, written there and we can, I can, I'm happy to read it out afterwards. Um, otherwise, when we get to the end, just uh, raise your virtual hand and we'll, we'll call on you to, uh, to ask your question yourself. Uh, so with that, I think that's uh, all I needed to say. I'm, we all want to hear Ravi anyway, so I'm going to do what I just said, turn off my mic and my video, and let Ravi give us this lecture. All right. Thank you, Rory. That was great. Uh, just to note that after I left my gravitational wave astronomy career, um, four years later, uh, they discovered the first gravitational wave uh, from an inspiring black hole. And then... Uh, Two years later, they won the Nobel Prize. Their collaboration won the Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery. So that worked out well for me, right? So anyway, uh, well, thank you for taking the time to attend the talk. Uh, I wish this was in person. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, some circumstances, as you know, the pandemic has uh, curtailed my travel significantly. So, and, and I hope we can get back to normal. So again, would like to thank everyone uh, for taking time uh, to come here uh, in these situations. Uh, usually my talks are short. I plan to talk for about 30 minutes uh, or so uh, and keep the rest of the time for discussion. And that's where I feel like uh, we have more time to have uh, some sort of ideas that we can think about and probably collaborate uh, later on. Um, here, I'm, I'm here to talk about a newly formed uh, astrobiology team, uh, CHANCE, which is a consortium on habitability and atmospheres of M-dwarf planets that was recently funded through a program called ICAR from NASA. It's the, you know, uh, it is interdisciplinary consortium for astrobiology research. Uh, and there were several teams selected, I think about six or seven of them, and ours is one of, the, one of those teams that was selected. Kevin Stevenson from uh, APL Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins is the program PI, and I am the science PI for this. And our goal is to study the planets around M dwarfs, and in particular, potential habitable planets uh, that are orbiting around them. I'm going to go to the next slide. Hmm. All right. So this is uh, one slide that. I'm trying to uh, convince everyone why 
MDORs are interest, interesting uh, stars to study and why the planets around them are more interesting to study as well. Uh, we, and I know several of you probably know many of these points already. Uh, so just bear with me while I give a brief intro uh, to a not, it's a very brief intro, but not a comprehensive intro to why we should study MDORF planets. Uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing several points in this, uh, important points in these uh, collection. So I've divided these into two categories. The top one is mostly for uh, what I view them as observational uh, opportunities and importance for MDORs and planets. And uh, the bottom one is the theoretical and modeling part of uh, why we should study MDORs, uh, MDORs planets. So if we go to the top one, as you can see, there, uh, you know, there's a plot on to the right of this slide. Uh, MDORs stars are uh, the dominant nearest neighbors in our galaxy. Uh, what I'm plotting here is on the x-axis is the spe stellar spectral type. Um, and when I say MDRs, uh, the, the effective temperatures are somewhere between 2600 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin is what I would define them as. Uh, these kind of uh, spectral types, M stars. And for comparison, sun is about uh, 5800 Kelvin as an effective temperature. And you can see that uh, this is from the Recon's uh, website. I just collected and made a plot out of it. Uh, within the 10 parsec, we have about <clears throat> uh, more than 250 M stars, and uh, uh, and they are the most dominant ones. And you can see that sun-like stars are, you know, a little bit lesser compared to uh, uh, significantly lesser compared to the M stars. We have also found in the recent decades at, or even in the last couple of years actually uh, MDRFs uh, have a higher planet occurrence which means there are more planets around them compared to uh, other stellar spectral types uh, furthermore uh, when we consider the transit uh, uh, technique the the M, M stars planets around M stars produce larger signal because of the smaller size of the star and so that could, you know, that could make us easy. That that would make us uh, easier to detect these uh, small transit signals. Even even the Earth-sized planets around uh, some of these stars uh, would be easier to detect compared to the Sun-like stars in the transit technique. Uh, for the and also there would be more. Uh, the planets around these stars would be amenable for near-term atmospheric ad observations. Some of them have. Uh, already been uh, studied uh, with some ground-based telescopes and also using Spitzer uh, telescope uh, to study the atmospheres of some of the planets around M dwarfs. And uh, they, they, they would be uh, relatively uh, easier for uh, compared to the sun-like stars with the same insulation uh, to study them. Also, uh, if you have noticed or probably heard that the nearest habitable zone planet um, uh, that was discovered, uh, Proxima Centauri B uh, is, uh, is orbiting around an M, M dwarf star. So we, can, we cannot find a closer uh, exoplanet that is in the habitable zone than the one uh, Proxima Centauri B. Also, they have shorter habitable zone orbital periods, so that would make us uh, easier to detect not only the planets and potentially if we have the enough, if we have enough telescope time, we would be able to characterize their atmosphere as well uh, for some of these interesting targets and, and, and I, I, I talk about I'll talk about these um, uh, planets uh, Trappist one for example is a prime example of that uh, with upcoming GMs of telescope okay so and uh, that that's as far as the observations are concerned but if we want to go and look at the nature of the planets um, around these stars they have a completely different radiation environment flares activities some Many of them are highly active and highly flaring um, compared to the sun. Uh, so their radiation environment is uh, different. They also are um, uh, tidal lock planets. Uh, uh, even some of the habitable zone planets are potentially in the tidal lock regime. Uh, so, and uh, they also have the planet sizes and order are different than what we find within our solar system. And so they would be a good comparison for uh, exoplanetology uh, when we want to compare them with our solar system planet arrangement. 
also the atmospheric circulation and dynamics would be different as well for many of these planets because of this uh, either they are uh, tidally locked or because of their radiation environment or because they um, they have uh, significant uh, uh, compositional difference between what we have uh, here in the solar system uh, compared to what they have in, uh, in planets around uh, uh, MDORFs. Their internal energy, uh, uh, I would, when I say this, this is uh, geothermal energy uh, is the one I'm thinking about, uh, uh, potentially seems to be have uh, a, a little bit uh, higher than what we have uh, on in, for Earth, at least in habitable zone planets. Uh, and their habitability has been a debate, uh, and it's a it's a question that we need we can answer only through observations at this point, uh, because there are pros and cons of discussing about the habitability of MDOS, You know why they could be habitable and why they cannot be habitable. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I I I realized it and was pointed to me uh, in one of the heliophysics uh, meetings I attended was that some of these planets could be in the stellar corona. Uh, Trappist one inner planet seems to be, they seem to be in the corona of the star. So that is incredibly amazing and uh, a fantastic realization that had. So that was a, <clears throat> that was a good thing to see. Uh, so such an awesome variety and diversity we have. And so uh, this makes it, makes them very exciting to study uh, to, as as a as a comparison to our own solar system, where we do not even the star itself is completely different. So, because this is an astrobiology team, so we would be talking about habitability. This M stars have all different kinds of planets, and they are also you know uh, warm Neptunes and super Earths and you know terrestrial sized planets around these ones. But we will be focusing uh, mostly on these uh, habitable potential habitable planets around m -dwarfs. And I'd like to compare them, uh, uh, compare these uh, with uh, what we have right now. So what I'm showing here is um, a plot of um, amount of stellar radiation on the x-axis on both of these uh, panels uh, on the left and the right-hand side. Uh, uh, essentially what it means is that on the x-axis, uh, when you see a 100%, what it means is that the planet is receiving the same level of uh, bolometric uh, flux uh, from the star as the Earth is receiving right now at this distance. So it's one times the Earth. If you see something uh, a, a 20 or 30 percent uh, higher or lower below uh, above this or below this 100 percent, it means that the planet is receiving 20 percent or 30 percent higher or lower amount of stellar radiation. On the y-axis is the effective temperature of the stars. Uh, of different uh, stars and the top ones are you know stellar spectral types of f and the bottom ones are m stars that we are uh, you know going to discuss um and the, they are you know they, they have a varied range of temperatures on the left hand side um well let's come to the right hand side here the have the right hand side shows the habitable zone estimates for um um, all of these stars as a function of the instant light on the on the on these planets on an Earth-like planet. Uh, if you keep them around each of these stellar spectral types, uh, don't worry too much about the uh, different ones. The, the the there are two kinds of habitable zone limits here. One is the conservative habitable zone limit, which is between the yellow, the runaway greenhouse, and the blue. Uh, the maximum greenhouse that's the region which we call a conservative habitable zone we can discuss about this later in the uh, discussion if you want to have uh, more uh, in-depth uh, uh, details about how we derive this and the optimistic ones are the ones between the recent venus and the maximum greenhouse between the red curve and the blue curve so the optimistic uh, 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 habitable zone is much larger compared to the conservative one again I know this, this is a this is a very carefully drafted and uh, crafted uh, definition of habitable zone, and there is a reason for that. And, and we will I can I can come and talk about that in the discussion if you if you want to. So I also plotted um, this is a plot generated by Sunny Herman. Actually, um, we 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 collected the known confirmed uh, exoplanets uh, from all the 
uh, discoveries, including transit and direct imaging or you know, radial velocity and every, uh, all of the detection techniques. And we plotted the currently known confirmed exoplanets on top of this. And we limited the sizes of these planets between half an Earth radii to 1.5 Earth radii. Uh, because above 1.5 Earth radii, we think that they would accumulate substantial at atmosphere, and we don't think them to be a rocky or terrestrial in nature. And below half an Earth radii, they may not sustain an atmosphere, an atmosphere um, which is somewhat motivated by what we see in our solar system with respect to Mars. And if you see that, if you look at this picture uh, image, you'll see that most of the discoveries of confirmed planets are seem to concentrate more towards the lower temperature stars, uh, somewhere around 4,000 and below, um, uh, if, if based on this restriction, restrictive definition and also restrictive size. Uh, and it is not a surprise because as we discussed before, it's, it's because they are easier to detect. And so the, we have more data or more planets uh, in, within the habitable zone. Now, whether they would, whether we would be able to observe their atmospheres or not is a separate question. But what we have right now is that we know more planets uh, in the habitable zone, terrestrial planet size, habitable zone uh, in the habitable zone compared to any other stellar spectral types around M stars. Okay, so what the left hand side of this plot is what we uh, termed as a Venus zone, a paper published by. Uh, Stephen Kane, myself, and John Donegal Goldman back in 2014 to define what would, where would be Venus uh, analogs uh, could exist. Uh, when, when I want to be clear here that when I say Venus analogs, it is not exactly the Venus uh, we, that we see within our solar system, uh, completely dominated by CO2 uh, and, and, and a dense atmosphere. So when, what I mean by a Venus analog here is uh, a planet that is either in the, undergoing a runaway greenhouse where it's dominated by a steam atmosphere with high pressures. And uh, on the other end, you would see uh, uh, our Venuses um, also. So a steam atmosphere planet is also a Venus uh, analog and a Venus, current Venus within our solar system is also a Venus analog. So all those planets together, what we call them as a Venus analogs in, 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 my, um, uh, in my definition of the uh, Venus. So if we want to do that, uh, and we want to have where would these Venus uh, analogs could uh, exist, uh, and we could define something called a Venus zone. Uh, again, we can uh, talk a little bit deep, uh, uh, deeper about this in the discussion. Uh, the Venus zone would lie a little bit inside of the runaway greenhouse limit, which is the inner edge of the habitable zone. Uh, and you can see we also plotted the, at the time, uh, we need to really update this plot. At that time, the candidate Venus zone planets, and they are uh, smeared out over different stellar spectral types. And this is also not a surprise because uh, it would be easier to detect these planets which are closer to the star. And you can see on the x-axis, the insulation, the amount of starlight the planets are receiving. Uh, they, they receive higher amount of insulation because they are closer to the stars and hence easier to detect around different kinds of stars as well. And so you would see a more uh, broader variety spectral type uh, occurrence for these Venus zone planets. The reason why I want to show these two plots is that using these two uh, uh, zones or at least uh, categories, we can uh, observationally study the limits of habitability and put our solar system in context. Uh, the end of habitability essentially here, when if we want to define the habitable zone, is where the inner edge of the hab zone is and where the outer edge of the hab zone is, which is the blue shaded region on the left side uh, of this uh, of this image. So if we know, if we can find out where the atmospheres are dominated by water, or maybe they have uh, a potential water vapor not dominated by them, or if we find some other ways to identify potential biosignatures, then we might be able to put our solar system in context and say that, okay, this is where the habitability ends and this is where the habitability begins. Uh, and, and that could be an observational determination of habitable zone or habitable limits of the habitability. Uh, and, and, and this would be great if we have a lot of telescope time. This is, again, I'm not discussing about how much time we would have, but this is a potential way to uh, identify 
where the ends of habitability are. So uh, as you can see, we have more planets than we have time for observations. Uh, and, and so something that we can uh, do in the meantime is to see if we have collaborate with observers and modelers uh, and learn from each other and see if we can understand uh, the systems that we cannot observe uh, anytime in the near future based on the observations that we can get uh, in the near future. And so this is where the motivation started for the CHAMPS team. Uh, and that's when we, uh, I, I contacted Kevin Stevenson uh, back uh, in 2019 uh, when we met at AppsIcon a long time ago and uh, discussed this, uh, this particular aspect of how to uh, study these planets uh, with um, uh, combining observations and models. I, uh, and later on, we again met at uh, another meeting at, in Iceland um, where Wiki, uh, Wiki Meadows was also part of the discussion. And uh, we, we formulated a program of how a plan of how to uh, write a proposal to observe these, uh, or learn more about these MDOR systems. So these, this is our team. Uh, we have uh, uh, local people, when I say local within Maryland, uh, we have uh, several institutions from APL, NASA, Space Telescope, to several uh, national in and international institutions as well. Uh, the composition of our team is roughly about 50% of our uh, members are uh, early career scientists and uh, many of us uh, a little bit more and I think about 70 per another two percent of them are um, uh, mid-career scientists as well so we have a relatively young population in terms of uh, the team composition so what do we do what did we uh, propose to do there well so the uh, the ICAR wanted to have an uh, overall broad science question and the science question that we wanted to address is can MDOF planets support life and if so how do we best observe and characterize them and to do that to we want to uh, address four ast astrobiology questions uh, one of them is how do habitable worlds and environments form and evolve essentially numerical simulations of uh, planetary formation how can we better understand the range of parameters that influence habitability is you know climates and so on what is the diversity of biosignatures that we might expect for habitable planets? Essentially, how the climate and photochemistry can produce different uh, uh, biotic and abiotic mechanisms. And uh, fourth one is how can we best observe and characterize potentially hab <coughs> habitable exoplanets? This is based on observations and uh, uh, what we can do with observations and what we can learn from observations and how can we use the models that we have developed uh, in to understand and interpret the data we collect. So the, de the deliverables are, uh, we want to develop and share some modeling framework to assess, accurately assess the habitability of terrestrial planets around MDORs. One of the things that we try to uh, do is to understand and remember that these are all planets that are tidally locked. So the, the, at the atmospheres and the climate would be uh, operating in a different regime than what we are familiar with. And so we want to use the models that can accurately uh, simulate those kind of uh, atmospheres. <clears throat> we would also be validating the new observing analysis techniques to uh, study these atmospheres of non-transiting planets. So transiting planets, we can use the transit technique and non-transiting planets, we can use something called uh, the phase curve observations. Uh, to receive uh, to to uh, detect the thermal emission coming from the planet itself as the planet is orbiting the star, uh, and then try to understand them uh, and in when they are not when we are not able to observe the transits. So there are there are different ways to do that. Uh, I'll discuss that um, in a moment. So we have four tasks <clears throat> that are connect that we can connect with these four astrobiology questions. Um, the one, the MDOF planetary processes is where we can go back and uh, look for numerical simulations of planet formation. Uh, the MDOF planetary atmospheres where we, we would be using uh, 3D climate models, uh, because when you are in a tidal lock regime, you would be able to, uh, the, the dynamics are completely different and you would be able to simulate that with a 3D climate model only. 
Uh, and then M dot star planet interactions, that's where the photochemistry part comes in. Uh, and then and, and flare activity of the star and how it affects the atmospheric erosion and so on. And the fourth one is the M dot exoplanet observations. And these tasks are actually interrelated. And, and deliverables from one task will be feeding into the inputs as the next task. And uh, these and some of the observations that uh, we will be doing with James Webb will give us some constraints on the feedback into these models that we will be doing uh, uh, later on once we get the data from James Webb. So the task one is where uh, we will explore the possible outcomes of um, planet um, internal structure and oxidation state from um, and body calculations, and they are subdivided into uh, three tasks. Uh, how do habitable worlds and environments reform and evolve is the first task one. Uh, so in 1A, we will uh, explore the terrestrial planet formation and around uh, MDOS uh, using NBODY code. That includes collision uh, model that permits a wide range of uh, outcomes for each collision. And uh, these uh, simulations will uh, have uh, determine where planets can form uh, and track the delivery and evolution of uh, water or the volatile content and estimate the bulk composition of terrestrial planets. And this is led, this will be led by uh, Elisa Quintana and Tom Barclay's team at Goddard. And these N-body results will uh, uh, act as inputs to a core formation chemical model uh, to, to determine the internal oxidation states of final planet configurations, which are inputs to our outgassing uh, fluxes uh, uh, in task 1b, which uh, will be led by Laura Schaefer from uh, Stanford. So this figure is an illustration of planet outcomes with different core and water for mass fractions. And this is, uh, we, this is something that we, we have uh, started recently. In the task uh, 1b, uh, we will use the results from task 1A uh, on core mass fraction and mantle thickness to uh, explore the effects of tectonic lifelines. Uh, and the mantle and core size will also influence the, the dynamo, the magnetic dynamo onset and lifetimes, uh, which we will do in task 1C, uh, uh, which will be led by David Brain from uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, so the task 1B also actually computes the outgassing fluxes of uh, hydrogen, water, and other uh, volcanic gases uh, that you see here and the couples them with the mantle thermal evolution model, the radiative convective model, the 1D climate model to compute the surface temperatures uh, for, for these uh, based on these gases. Uh, so this is something that I, we work with, uh, I work with uh, um, Laura uh, trying to couple the 1D climate model that we have in our group with her uh, thermal evolution model. And the outgassing results, we need to know uh, what are the gas fluxes will be given to task two, which is the planetary atmospheres, where we use them uh, to determine the, uh, the mixing initial mixing ratios uh, we want to use in our climate models. There is also task 1C, uh, which will modify the thermal evolution model developed in task uh, 1B to uh, include the heat transport from the core to the mantle and the in internal structure models for 1A will be used to uh, uh, populate the starting uh, conditions for these um, uh, thermal evolution model. So we this will be led by um, uh, Dave Brain and uh, we, we, we are still uh, about to start this and we have to um, we have we are waiting on uh, some of the tasks to finish their job. We just started six months ago. So uh, we'll have some results at some point soon. And uh, the results from this task one uh, will be fed to task two, like I said, with the outgassing fluxes. This is where uh, we use the 3D climate model, system models uh, to explore the habitable conditions over a wide range of parameter space of atmospheric properties. Uh, to, because we want to understand how the range of parameters would influence habitability. To do this, 3D models, climate models are very expensive to run. And if we want to run on a wide range of parameters, we want to select uh, the simulations um, uh, carefully. And for that, we, uh, uh, we, we have a model called a quasi Monte Carlo algorithm developed by uh, Jacob Hackmischer, uh, who's also a team member on this. 
uh, to iteratively explore the, the parameter space uh, uh, that we will be getting from uh, task one. Uh, and we will use the inputs from task one and task three where we get the uh, mixing ratio models as well. And the idea is to create a database of 3D climate models to for different atmospheric conditions. Whenever we see that uh, uh, there is a, uh, a iterative procedure, we want to see if some of the models are stable or not. And once they are stable, we will go proceed to the next stage where we will provide the pressure temperature profiles from our climate models to the photochemical models because a photochemical model needs a profile, temperature profile. And then uh, that, that the photochemistry model will take uh, the profiles and determine the final mixing ratios uh, of that particular configuration of the system. Uh, so this is a plan of how our tasks are interconnected. This, has, this was from our actual proposal, but it has changed. Uh, based on several things, um, and it, there's a newer uh, and a more updated version of how our tasks are conduct, uh, connected with the quasi Monte Carlo uh, approach. Uh, I will, uh, if you want, I can I can discuss that later in the uh, in the discussion part of the section. One of the important things uh, and the most uh, impactful things that uh, we we will know from a 3D climate model using a 3D climate model is that um, water clouds. Uh, would raise the continuum level by, a flat, you know, and then they flatten, flatten the spectral lines and reduce the relative transit depth of other species. Because in our models, we see that uh, when uh, several of these uh, uh, simulations or uh, global climate simulations show that uh, there's a significant amount of water, if you start with, of course, a water vapor atmosphere or water on the surface on, on the planet, uh, and, and that could potentially uh, contaminate, or uh, if you call this contamination, it's, I guess, if you see clouds, that's, that's probably fine, but it's not a bug or it's a feature. And, but, but it will have an effect on tiny um, spectral signals. It may not be as uh, uh, bad for a, uh, a species like a carbon dioxide or CO2, because they have strong features in some parts of the spectrum. Uh, and we found that, uh, in fact, uh, Erin May, Tad Komachek uh, published a paper, and Thomas Fauche uh, is leading this uh, cuisine's task. They both independently found that uh, when we use 3D models, um, they indicate a change in the continuum level from transit to transit. So it's actually, I mean, I, I, hope, I wish I had an animation to show here that the continuum level changes. And so the, the, the strength of the spectral features also change when you go from transit to transit if you, if you uh, use a 3D climate model on this. And so that could pro potentially impact what would be the, uh, the detectability of um, some of these features and also the signal to noise ratio on some of these systems. So if you want, there's a paper uh, that Erin, Tad, and even Toma published. Uh, I, can, I can send you that one too. Oops. This is a uh, task three where we study how the radiation emitted from uh, MDOR stars affect the chemistry and stability of exoplanetary atmospheres and biosignatures. Uh, in, in, so this is also divided into four tasks uh, and task three compiles high resolution synthetic spectra from um, uh, XUV made, inf to mix, uh, made infrared for you know, several different spectral types. Uh, Sarah Peacock is leading this. Sarah is amazing. She's extremely organized and she's, she's been doing fantastic work on this one. Uh, I'll discuss uh, Sarah's slide in the next one. Uh, but when, when we go to uh, at, uh, the next task, the task 3C, I'll, I'll, see, I'll tell you why we, have, we jumped to uh, task 3C. The goal of that is to measure the effects of stellar flares on the chemistry of the planetary atmospheres. Uh, to do that, we have uh, we are going to use uh, Wacom. Uh, it's a 3D coupled chemistry climate model uh, to test the influence of stellar flares and coronal mass ejections on the atmospheres of these uh, M dwarf planets. So many of them M stars are quite active, and and not only they affect the atmospheric erosion, it also affects their atmospheric chemistry, and we have to study them in a global uh, atmospheric. Uh, um, uh, situation. So what we want to do is we want to use a 3D coupled climate uh, chemistry model, uh, and this is going to be done by Howard Chen, who recently graduated from Northwestern University and who's going to be an NPP with me uh, starting in January. 
So we will be using this uh, Stellar uh, uh, templates, uh, the SCD templates that uh, Sarah will be developing uh, in our uh, 3D chemistry climate model to study how these uh, stellar flares will influence the atmospheric uh, erosion and uh, chemistry. Um, and we will be using uh, in our task uh, 3B. Oh, yeah, here you go, Sarah's uh, slide. Um, this is uh, this is wonderful. Uh, so what uh, Sarah is trying to do is to use the Phoenix atmospheric code to uh, get the uh, representative spectra of TRAPPIST-1 at various ages throughout its entire evolutionary history using a previously published paper from, from her uh, in 2019 and to model the present day spectrum. So the idea is to see if um, uh, test, uh, if uh, TRAPPIST-1 is in a, uh, we still saturated uh, UV flux regime, or if the flux has dropped by you know a few factors between then and its age, uh, the present age. This has significant uh, influence on how much atmosphere the plan the planets in the trapper system could retain, uh, and so that would be really uh, crucial for our uh, climate models uh, that we want to uh, simulate because we want to know what would be the initial pressure we would be starting from. At the surface pressure that we would be starting from in our climate model, we would want to know how much atmospheric composition uh, of different species we want to include. So all for all that, Sarah's uh, uh, XUV model, uh, spectral model is really, really important. And uh, Sarah has already done that and accomplished that. So this is pretty cool, actually. Um, in uh, task 3B, where we, uh, uh, have a uh, uh, look at the uh, long-term evolution of exoplanet atmospheres. I think uh, this will be led by uh, Kathy Mann from uh, APL and Jay Clustic Eager, who is a VPL member and also past uh, UW undergraduate. Um, uh, and they would be studying how the flare activity affects the atmospheric erosion. Uh, and task 3D will be uh, about uh, estimating how what kind of uh, mixing ratios uh, we would be we would be obtaining because of this activity and because of the temperature profiles that we would be getting from task two climate models and how they would be uh, driving the photolysis uh, that could potentially produce biotic and abiotic uh, biosignature gases like ozone and oxygen uh, and and uh, Eddie's already done massive amount of work on this and uh, the plan is to generate a grid of uh, models, chemical profiles, with uh, estimates of biosignature, biosignature gas abundances. Uh, the stellar, of course, UV spectrum is the one that drives the, the, uh, the photochemistry. And again, this is where uh, Sarah's work is going to be uh, crucial for uh, determining what kind of a chemical composition the particular atmosphere would, would be having. It. And then comes the task four. All of this, uh, we want to see how it can be applicable for uh, uh, observations. So this is where we want to compute, uh, simulate uh, with uh, spectral synthesis models, uh, transmission, uh, transit and phase uh, resolved emission spectra uh, uh, for different ranges of uh, spectral regions, depending upon the observatory. If you are looking for James Webb, we will be doing it for near spec and uh, MIRI kind of uh, uh, spectral ranges, bandwidths, or if we are looking for origins, uh, it, we will we will do it for uh, the entire mid infrared region. And by the way, uh, we just heard this uh, today that uh, the decadal will be making some decisions, or the report will be coming out uh, next week on November fourth. So we will know what uh, what will happen by that time. And, and the idea here is uh, with, this uh, with this observational task is to see if the number of uh, planets have atmospheres in the first place. I think it is kind of, uh, at least for closing planets, there seem to be some kind of an indication that they may have. Um, so um, I forget, K218b uh, is, a, is a planet around an M dwarf or it's a K star, I forgot, I forgot that. Um, but some of them, they found some water vapor in the atmosphere. So for very low mass stars uh, in the M dwarf spectral uh, type, uh, some of them may or may not have an atmosphere. It would, it would be good to detect with these exoplanet observations. And we want to also know if, the, if any of these planets could support 
uh, liquid water on the surface and of course detect biosignatures um, based on these observations to do that um, kevin and his team have uh, developed a technique called pi which is the planetary infrared access it's a method to characterize transiting and also the noun transiting exoplanet at atmospheres um, what's the pi technique well the idea here is to um, separate the flux from an exoplanet from uh, the host star it, it, it's usually really hard because the planet the star is quite bright so trans transiting planets when they're transiting in front of the star they when they're going behind the star as they're uh, uh, going to the secondary eclipse uh, if you have enough wavelength coverage then the thermal emission from the planet itself could potentially be resolved spectroscopically uh, if we have a high, enough high resolution and, uh, and also enough band, uh, bandwidth uh, into the uh, infrared part of the spectrum. So as an illustration here, it's uh, described in uh, Kevin's uh, paper uh, from 2020, where you, know, you can see uh, there is a, the blue curve is the stellar uh, uh, SED spectrum and the planetary infrared excess, the infrared excess amount radiation coming from the planet is shown um, in the dashed uh, curve. Uh, uh, when you have a reference wavelength uh, in the lower part of the regions of the, uh, of the bandwidth, you can see, uh, you, can, you can use it as a guide and then uh, build with your, with your models and try to draw the stellar spectrum and then see if there is any excess emission in, in the longer wavelength regions. And see and con and attribute anything excess you see beyond that region to uh, a planet's uh, infrared uh, radiation. Uh, as you can guess, this is usually uh, this usually works for uh, hot planets because you know they emit a lot of uh, infrared radiation, and this is what uh, they uh, showed Jacob Lustig Eager and Kevin Stevenson and May. Uh, Laura and everyone, uh, they published a paper, I think just recently, um, on how to retrieve the exoplanet atmospheres around our Jupiters with this technique. And this is the first paper from Chance, and I was hoping our task two would be the one, but darn, Kevin beat us uh, with his, uh, with his uh, team. That's good. So uh, one of the things that we, uh, we can, we have, uh, found recently and also have achieved is that uh, a couple of team members have uh, secured James Webb uh, guest observation uh, programs. Some of them are quite large. Uh, this one is uh, Kevin and Jake again, uh, and they are going to look uh, at five planets uh, and they got time for about 75 hours uh, within plant size ranges of 0.7 to 1.7 radii to do transmission spectroscopy with near spec prism. Uh, and the main idea of uh, this program is to see if rocky planets, m of planets have atmospheres or not. Uh, and this is, uh, and while this is great, we also have Natasha Battaglia and uh, as one of our team member and with collaboration with Joanna Teske, they got a geo observation of 11 planets uh, with 141, whatever, 142 hours. Uh, to observe planets in the size range of one to three Earth radii. One of the criticism we received from our uh, um, uh, reviews is that, you know, we need to have uh, some James Webb time. Well, there you go. We got it. So we will be using, whenever James Webb uh, goes up, whenever we get the data, we will we'll be using the, uh, the data from these observations to influence and inform our models uh to to feed back into uh, our models and then redo our pipeline analysis to study these atmospheres of uh, m dwarf planets in total we have about 16 nearby m dwarf planet observations that we have uh, we can do with james webb so what i wanted to show here is that you know the exoplanets are are while solar system planets are great and nice exoplanets give a multi-dimensional uh, view of what lies what is lying out there for to study in terms of atmospheres and also uh, the wide variety of uh, planets uh, that we can learn about uh, and and in if we want to understand them it is not just enough to uh, uh, 
uh, depend on only one of these, uh, either observations or modeling. And what we want to show here is that we want to work together uh, and have some sort of a uh, pipeline ready when the actual observations come uh, from James Webb for these uh, pla MDOF planets and have them, uh, if we have something to do with uh, any of these uh, modeling of uh, atmospheres, combining with uh, you know, accurate modeling of 3D climate models or chemistry and atmospheric loss and thermal evolution, planet formation, and in, if observations can inform them, we can go and revise them and have and be ready for the next phase of uh, uh, studying these uh, end of planets. Because we have more, like I said, we have more planets than we can study. So there's an ample amount of data available. It's just a matter of uh, time that we, uh, we study many of them to understand the broader nature of these uh, M star planets. Where do we stand right now, the timeline? Well, uh, we have uh, started our work in May. Uh, it's supposed to be lasting for three years. Uh, we have James Webb observations expected to start in the May of the next year uh, for two years, one to two years. And the idea is to complete the work in time for our next re-proposal in 2024, where we would be having uh, uh, a wealth of data from James Webb from different cycles and uh, try to propose something uh, even more cooler because we will be learning even more fantastic results uh, from, uh, from these observations. All right, I'm going to pause here, I actually stop here, and then uh, I'm ready for any of your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ravi. That was fantastic. Uh, so yes, we do have uh, time for some questions here. So uh, um, as I said before, if you, have a question, there's one or two ways you can ask it. You can either type the question in the chat and I'll be happy to read it out to Robbie, or you can raise your virtual hand and I will call on you and I will encourage you to, uh, uh, to uh, start your video so that you can speak to Robbie directly and he can see you. So um, if you have any questions, please go ahead. All right, well, you're getting some great talks there. So. Um, well, um, maybe while we get started, uh, when we wait for uh, some questions, I have one for you, Robbie, um, which was going back to the beginning where you were talking about formation. You were talking about end body simulations for the planet formation. Uh, but I think there's a lot of ideas now that um, M dwarf planets may be formed farther out and they migrate in. Is that gonna be something you're considering uh, with champs or are you kind of just focusing on like the in situ formation no i think elisa uh, did talk about this so there would be some migration models uh, as well i think she's working with uh, billy quarles i believe um, uh, and they have some preliminary simulations of uh, one particular system uh, and, the, and that includes uh, migration as well uh, one of the things i forgot to mention is that we uh, as a as a test case we are going to start with the trappist 1e uh, planet uh, to see how we can uh, simulate um, a bunch of uh, end body uh, and bunch of planetary systems of different configurations uh, that are close enough to the Trappist 1e uh, type of uh, system configuration, and then see how we can uh, build up a, an atmosphere model from these simulations, uh, build up a photochemistry model from these simulations. Uh, and then once we have a handle on that, then we will expand it to a wide variety of spectral types. That includes uh, where uh, uh, the migration of and body, uh, migration of this plant formation system as well. Um, uh, I think she's using, uh, if I'm, I, I wish Eliza was here, I think she's using uh, Mercury, um, which you and I know quite well, so. <laughs> Great, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, see, so I saw Don Brownlee turn on his camera. I'm not sure if he has a question. He has got some technical difficulties. He did wave his hand at me. I, I, there you go. All right, yes, go uh, ahead. Very, very nice talk. Uh, I, I was just interested in how well you could determine the age of an M star and how do you expect the habitability of a habitable planet around an M star to change, not on the short term, but over the long term, over 10 billion years? I mean, because it's important to know when you're looking at a younger planet or, or something that's 8 billion years old. 
So the age is pretty, thank you. Uh, so the age is pretty much uh, unconstrained. I think uh, uh, some of these ages are, uh, have a plus or minus of a few billion years. And so if we, if we stick to that kind of uh, age estimate uncertainty, then, and if we want to discuss about the habitability of these planets within that uh, time scale of a you know, few billion years or so, uh, many of these M stars are quite active in the beginning of phase, mm -hmm you know, uh, and, and, and depends upon the type of the subspectral type of the M star, how long this activity lasts in the, uh, from, from their uh, formation to, uh, you know, when they, when they get mature. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, as uh, Sarah's work is uh, trying to show, uh, we do not know for TRAPPIST-1 system, which I think is at the TRAPPIST-1 star is at the lowest end of the, you know, M dwarf uh, spectral type. They, they, it may still be in the um, active phase, uh, high, uh, you know, quite active phase. And so, if you are asking me, you know, what do you think about the habitability of the planets around uh, uh, around this this particular star? Um, I, you know, I am. I, I would, this is being recorded, right? So I am going to uh, say that, well, I, I have my doubts, but I would be thrilled if I am proved wrong uh, if, if with, with any of these James observations. Uh, it is a question if they have even atmospheres. I don't know how, uh, you know, there are f pros and cons of uh, how habitability can be maintained on M stars, you know, activity can ruin them. Oh, but if they have water, but they, and there is some life on subsurface, uh, you know, uh, then activity may not be have, you know, that much of a problem. Oh, but then they have a geothermal heat, quite a bit of it. So that may be too much. And well, well the atmospheric rotation may make the surface temperature a little bit uh, cooler. So, so there, you know, there is a back and forth here. And I, I my personal, my personal feeling again here if, uh, is that, you know, I find it a little bit difficult to see how habitability can be maintained. But again, there are, like I said, there are both pros and cons that you can argue to maintain habitability on these planets. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I think the next hand I saw was from somebody whose login name appears to be Chima McGruder. Sorry if I yeah. mispronounced that, but yeah, please go ahead. Pronounced it perfectly. Right, great, great, great talk, Ravi. Uh, my question is: so you, you were talking about using the um, Phoenix models to understand the uh, um, atmospheres, the M dwarf stars. Um, how reliable do you feel those models are? Um, and is there any uh, avenues that your that your team is undertaking to improve it? Because like currently the models are not the uh, most consistent with observations of indoor stars spectra? Uh, so we use uh, Phoenix models in two different ways. One is in our climate models, in our 3D climate models, if we don't worry about photochemistry part of that, right? And so we, uh, if we, 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 we have done simulations of uh, several spectral types of uh, M dwarfs from M0 to M8, which is from 2600 to 4000. And for us, we need an, uh, you know, an SED spectrum for several of these uh, range of these stars. Phoenix model uh, uh, seems to be uh, working fine. Uh, this is the BT settle models, right? So um, Franz Allard uh, uh, is, um, uh, was the one who uh, created these models. So for our climate models, these are quite adequate. And so we, we, we have no problem using them. Uh, because we just need what, the infrared spectra uh, part of the spectrum that we want to use it in our climate model because we use uh, we have water vapor and CO2 dominated atmospheres and they are uh, quite efficient uh, in absorbing the infrared part of the spectrum uh, compared to um, uh, any other gas species. Whereas M stars have a significant amount of uh, their SED uh, in the infrared, right? So we would be able to, so that is quite fine for uh, our climate models. But if you are asking if we, how accurate is Phoenix models for, you know, for other models like photochemistry model or, you know, atmospheric escape model. I think uh, um, Sarah uh, is you uh, use the Phoenix atmospheric code to compute the spectra of the TRAPPIST-1. And for photochemistry model, we use, we attach in the Lyman alpha region or in the UV region, 
uh, for, from uh, data from some of the observed stars uh, uh, that we have uh, collected data from either Muzzle's uh, data uh, set or um, uh, some of uh, other observed um, uh, UV, uh, FUV to uh, EUV spectra. And then we attach it to the UV part of the spectrum and use them in the photochemistry part of the code. So it is, it is not, so we, won't, we don't just use the just Phoenix models. We take the Phoenix model as a representative normal background SED spectra and uh, tack on uh, the UV part with an observed data set from the known similar stellar temperature one and then use that in the photochemistry model. So why, why, will, why wouldn't you use, if you're using observation to, to constrain the UV, UV, why are you not using it for the infrared as well? Because we don't have uh, a full broadband spectral coverage okay. for um, all the stars that we, in the range of stars that we want, we consider. We have for okay. very few only. So we just have to pick and choose which one we want to do. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Cool, cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think the next hand I saw was from Galen Bergsten. Hi, Ravi, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I may have missed this, but I have a question about, uh, I think your task one, um, specifically about the, the core mass fractions of the planets around MDORS. Uh, if you're obviously interested in nearby MDORS, I don't expect the stellar metallicity to change a whole bunch, but I was interested if you've considered any like stellar metallicity dependence in the core mass fractions of planets. Ah, I, let me see. Uh, there's a table in our uh, proposal where we, I thought we had a, so, we, uh, I'm looking at the table right now. Um, so I think for the moment, for the moment, we assume the solar metallicity uh, uh, stars for all of them. But um, as we just discussed, the Phoenix models, for example, also have um, different, uh, the SAD spectra for different metallicities. And so we can potentially do a different metallicity uh, uh, core mass fraction simulations as well. Uh, it becomes the, the numerical simulations from the plant formation people, uh, you know, they can do it quite well. But then the bottleneck is the 3D climate simulations. So they can generate 10,000 simulations of different metallicities and different star, uh, you know, stellar spectral ranges. And if they give us 10,000 simulations uh, to the 3D climate modelers, we have to carefully cho pick and choose because we, uh, we take a lot of uh, time to run these simulations, to convert these simulations. And so while in theory, we can do it. We have to be really careful in choosing what kind of a metallicity range and uh, how many simulations we want to choose within the in within that range. So yes, it is possible to do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to look to the chat where we have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, so the first one is from Dax Felis, Felice, excuse me, who says. Uh, is the CHAMPS collaboration only interested in studying the atmospheres already detected and confirmed exoplanets, or is there also interest in detection of new exoplanet candidates like TOIs from the test mission? Um, so far now, we are looking at the TRAPPIST-1E system for various reasons, because we want to develop a pipeline so that if there is any new system that comes into you know, uh, our attention, then we can just use the same pipeline for that system and then try to do the same analysis. So, uh, so the, the answer to your question is yes and no, because yeah, uh, no in the sense that we are trying to focus on developing the pipeline right now, but in the future, uh, once we have a nice set of uh, pipeline ready, we would be able to do the candidates, interesting candidates for uh, TOIs or, uh, you know, from the test mission or even the K2 mission, because we want to respond to what is happening in the new discoveries in the exoplanet field. So. That is what we are trying to get ready for. So to get ready for that, we need to be having tools ready. And that's the tool development stage is where we are right now. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we've got from Neil Turner. It looks like he's got two questions for you. These will be the last two, I think. And for everybody, uh, we've reached uh, the top of the hour here. So if you have somewhere to be at four o'clock here on the West Coast, uh, just heads up. Um, but the uh, first question from Neil is, what could be learned about the habitable zone M dwarf planets from the compositions of companion planets? Well, we assume that um, we, you know, planet formation is um, um, is consistent with with what the planets within within that system um, they they all form within 
a similar range of compositional formation. Uh, that is an assumption again. And so, uh, but you can point to Venus and Earth and say, okay, Venus has significant CO2 atmosphere. Can you say the same thing about the Earth as well? So of course that will uh, directly uh, deviate. Uh, so if I see and if we see, for example, uh, a, a water vapor atmosphere inside the inner edge of the half zone, which is closer to the star, because that is easier to detect in terms of um, uh, atmospheric characterization. And if you ask me, okay, you saw a planet that is closer to the star and you found water vapor in it, steam atmosphere in it, and uh, there is a habitable zone planet in the, in the same system, but we cannot observe it because it takes longer time or whatever. So what can we say is something about it? Well, I would say that I would still uh, think that there would be that would be an interesting system that points to me that there, if a planet that is closer to the star can maintain uh, water vapor in its atmosphere, I would guess that uh, the planet within the habitable zone may have some sort of a, a water atmosphere on it as well. So that kind of information is what I'm looking for if I can observe only the ones that are nearby, uh, closer to the star. Right. Thank you. And uh, our last question, also from Neil Turner, is uh, for tightly locked planets where transit measurements probe near the terminator, how does what we can learn about the atmosphere differ from more Earth-like situations? How does uh, what we can learn about the atmosphere differ from more Earth-like situations? Okay. So, oh my God, this is an excellent question. Uh, there is uh, there is a <laughs> So for these tidal lock planets, the, the climates are completely different. I, I wish I'm trying to quickly pull a simulation, but I don't know if I have time here. Um, so what happens is for these, uh, for these planets that are tidal locked around these uh, uh, MDORs, they, they, uh, they have an um, uh, circulation regime that is completely different than what we have uh, seen in our solar system. Okay, there you go, I found one. Quickly, I'm, I promise I will not take more than one minute or so. All right. Okay. Can you all see this one? Um, yes, we can. Oh, very good. Thank you. So this is a simulation that shows uh, how different rotation rates uh, this, the, uh, affects uh, the circulation and the cloud structure of planets. M dwarf planets, plants in the habitable zones of uh, uh, M stars, they are tidally locked and some of them are synchronously rotating. The same side of the planet is facing the star. In that case, the, the, the cloud structure would be completely different. If you see on the top, that's one day planet rotation like Earth. And it's, you know, you can see banded cloud formation structure on the, uh, around the equator and so on. But as you go more towards longer and longer uh, 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 rotational, uh, periods, four days to 85 days, you'd see the clouds have uh, for collected at the substellar point of the planet that is facing towards the star all the time. And so you wouldn't, uh, this, kind of a, this kind of a cloud structure could affect your transit observations. And I think that is what you are, uh, you, you are trying to ask. Uh, how does, is that right? Yes. Where transit measurements probe near the term, how do we learn about the atmosphere that differs from more Earth-like planets? So if you see these kind of simulations, if you see this kind of water vapor um, uh, uh, in the transit uh, terminator part of the uh, region, you can model them with our 3D climate models and then figure out what kind of uh, atmosphere these planets could have uh, if they have water on them. All right, great. Thank you very much, Ravi. So I think at this point we should wrap it up. So by whatever means you can. Let's thank Ravi again. Uh, so yeah, hopefully we'll all see you in person sometime in the near future, Ravi. So um, with that, we'll uh, close the room and uh, next week we'll have another uh, seminar.